There was genocide before I was born. There was genocide when I was born. There is still genocide going on now. In fact, death has never left us alone. It has been following us throughout the times, at the late sundown and in the sun's birth at dawn. It has choked us in the dark seas, tombed us beneath the hard sands across the unfriendly borders, and it is squeezing us now in between the closed walls of camps, and we die bit by bit. I wonder if you have ever stared at death in the eye, woke up at the feeling of a slow and painful grinding? Did you ever feel so invisible like you didn't even exist? Yes, this is my life. I mean the life of all refugees. You've heard it right. We have been counting down our times while staring at the death in the aisle for seven, and eight, and some of us up to 12 years. We wake up with the feeling of nothingness, of invisibility, like we don't exist at all. We have even forgotten what living feels like, as we are forced to beg for every single breath just to remain alive. And you might wonder, who are refugees? What kind of creatures are these? Well, a refugee is someone who escaped from carnage, looked at death in the eye, ran from bullets to stay alive. Someone who escaped the stalking death, sighed, moaned, gasping each time for a single breath. Someone who becomes a husk, a despairing, lonely shadow, a priceless and unwanted treasure. Someone who loses identity and fades away like a forgotten poem and accompanied only by haunting traumas. Yes, we are, but more than refugees. A refugee is someone who knows about love, worships the, un the unfenced expansion of the sky, carries the tenderness of Annie in the body. Someone who values caring for each other, longs to provide for the family, remembers the kindness of nature, honors respect, and cries for those who die, and creates with those who still continue to live. Remember that we are more than refugees. Here are those of us who despite knowing the limitations of life, willingly dedicate most of themselves to educate the younger generation when the government's schools doors shut on them. Learning centers, English classes, and beautiful handicraft activities are a good example of that. We use the least resources to make sure that we are useful to our surroundings. And we overcome challenges with love, patience, and persistence just like Mars is growing on hard rocks, which you may call resilience. So, we are more than refugees, but do not forget our struggles. We have to die many times before we make it to a safe place. And it feels nice to be in a safe place, see no war, hear no more bomb explosions, or fear to be killed. But this doesn't mean the end of everything. In fact, the challenge is big and right from where you end up as a refugee with no certain future ahead. And you have to push yourself extremely hard to feed and long. And this is always a privilege that may or may not be given and is always momentary. Imagine finding yourself in a country where you don't have the right to education to travel, to drive, to get married, or to have employment opportunities. How long can you survive without earning? A month? Two? A year? This sounds hard, doesn't it? What about seven, eight, and even more? What about the COVID-19 pandemic? Some of my Indonesian friends were scared of losing their job a month after the COVID-19 pandemic. 
They were scared about how to sustain themselves and their families. They scared how to pay the rent, electricity bill, and school fees. You might now know how hard it is to get used to live in uncertainty. You might now know the feeling of sleeping more than enough because you have nothing else to do but to force yourself to sleep again. I really wonder if the COVID-19 pandemic has given you a glimpse of what it is like to live in confinement, where you are not allowed to do many things, can't meet your friends, meet your parents, and are unable to get out of your rooms even. How does it feel for you when your kids ask for food but you can't afford it? Have you ever given up your meal for standing days in a line or eaten slow to save the rest for the next day so you starve slowly? How does it feel for you living in separation from your loved ones for an unknown number of years? What do you think about not being able to see the faces of your siblings and parent, parents ever again? This is only a small example of life and the restrictions. I have been living the life of lockdown since 2014, and it feels like you die out and get back to life and it still should hold on that life of nothingness. Yes, we refugees wake up to the face of these bitter facts for an unknown number of mornings. We wake up worried about the safety of our loved ones. We wake up scared, numb and frozen, scared how to pass the rest of the day. There were times when I had nothing to eat but the rotten carrots to remain alive on. I couldn't afford clean water but had to drink from the contaminated tap water. I was roasting in deep chronic pain with kidney infections and hunger. I'm about to forget the taste of Landi Palau, Kamel and Mantu. Can you imagine not being able to eat tempeh, taco and boxer for more than seven years? As a single refugee, I still wake up at midnight due to haunting nightmares with no one beside me to hold my hands, but myself alone. I squeeze myself into a tight hack as hard as I can to ease the pain of sharp knives that keep digging, digging through my hollowed out stomach from inside out. Excruciating pain shoots through my traumatized body. It torments and keeps jolting me awake. And no one witnesses this except the breathless walls or my fast pumping chest, longing to catch up a few cold teardrops. For us refugees, at some point, survival becomes so expensive that it almost requires a whole life just to remain alive. Let us remember the 25 refugees who have ended their lives tangled in the dark web of life. And there are those who do know that we are more than refugees. My foster father, Dr. Rostan, he used to feed me just like a little baby with that delicious meat durian. I suffered from hunger for so long that I couldn't stop eating. In a couple of months, I almost looked like a ch chubby deer. I think we poured a bang of tears during the editing process. My foster mother, Pamden, the New Zealand High Commissioner to Malaysia, who gives me the sense of belonging and instills in me the love of a mother. His Excellency Mr. Radrandra Tandon, the Indian ambassador to Kabul, who used to say, Abdul, love even those who caused you pain. Major Donovan, who is a temple herself. Ibu Amanda Damayanti, who embraced me like one of her own family members. Lasmina, who fed me with compassion, took me to the hostel over dozens of times, driving more than 80 kilometers and made me feel more Indonesian and at home. 
my own landlord, Bob Hawk and Ipu, who comforted me like caring parents. Bob Hawk would sit with me for hours when I was distressed just to make sure that I am calm. Kevin Yao, Ichilin, Safira, Ruby Astari, Jin Jin Shu, Janet Galbraith, Shin Shin, my refugee fellows, and my poet friends, Adil Saru Wejoyo, and the beautiful illustrator Cindy Saja, GRS members, and many more names to recite. They have given so much of themselves to keep my heart flourishing. They have been the brightest lanterns in the darkness. It reminds me of my childhood moments. Life was normal back then. But unlike other kids, mine soon fell apart. I grew up faster, faster than my age. I felt more adult when I was just a child and feel more childlike as I have grown up. I was only eight, nine or ten when I first became a refugee. And I am not the only one, but the fifth generation running behind closed borders for protection. And with these, more than 62% of my tribe, Hazaras, are gone under the slow, grinding genocide. In 1996 to 1997, everything changed. Life turned into a heinous nightmare with the occupation of the pro-Taliban. My school tents turned into war fronts. The rooms were filled with rockets and missiles. The shelling sounds of machine guns replaced the national anthem. The grieving screams of mothers replaced the morning songs of birds. My little sister was murdered. My elder brother Abdullahad was shot but survived. And me, my mother, suffered more than anyone in the family. My father and I were held in captivity in Shiraz, Iran. I was then deported. The Taliban put me in a live shooting line. Three people were shot right in front of my eyes in Kandipush, Afghanistan. I still remember the warm blood splashed over my face as they shot him. I then became a child laborer and treated as a slave in the construction sites in Iran. I was only born in Afghanistan. There is a chance that you could have been born there too. I never felt I belonged in that country. In fact, it never accepted me. It kept kicking me in the heart each time I ran to it. I felt more of a refugee in Afghanistan than I feel here in Indonesia. There are pens that I cannot cry nor can I scream them. I only stare and smile as I slowly break down into pieces from inside. And I am but more than a refugee. You know, during the good old times, Baba used to place a reddish lamp in the middle. We were sitting in a circle around the lamp and he would recite poems from Hafiz Shirazi Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi and Sadi with some hot cups of chai to keep our mouths flourishing. I believe poetry would form in anyone in that kind of setup. I was raised to love poetry and, it, and this runs in my veins now. I would then perform those poems to my classmates that I learned from Baba. Slowly I started crafting words, lining them up to express my feelings. Soon this turned into a habit. I started writing more regularly when I was in Pakistan. I wrote to express the suffering of my experiences as a child leper in Iran, the horror I witnessed fleeing to Iran from Pakistan, and what I had seen on my way from Herat, Afghanistan to Kandahar during the epic time of the Taliban. In 2007, I again did return to Afghanistan thinking that the security situation had improved and that I could help my people to rebuild a war-torn country. I started my career as a journalist and humanitarian networker, but soon my uncensored writings became unpalatable and my life was threatened. My father and brother were kidnapped 
my family was tortured, and I was recaptured by horror. I headed myself in Pakistan for 16 months before being forced to flee to Indonesia as an asylum seeker, where the psychiatrists diagnosed me with high levels of PTSD and depression. Somehow, I picked up my pen again, even on the footpath after I realized that I could no longer practice my journalism in Indonesia as an asylum seeker. I only had a notebook and a pencil, not even a handphone. I used to sit under a thick green tree in Chisawa for hours crafting poetry while voluntarily teaching women refugees English with Jedrid Refugee Service for about four years. Those feelings of loneliness, hunger, and pain were worth enduring. They led me to great artists like Park Gunawan Muhammad, Park Sepathi, and many other famous authors. My poet friends from Anmast helped me shape myself. I recited my clumsy poems on the stage with honor. Sometimes I had to even skip meals to save some money so I could attend their next event. I often would get lost, thanks to Rubia Stari, Safira, and Ayu, who, like bright lanterns, guided me where they thought I belonged. I felt like life and energy returned to me. With them, I felt at home. People who understood, embraced, healed, and uplifted me. Ayotami from Communita Salihara was the first gateway. In 2018, she invited me to Communita Salihara as one of the speakers. That was the first stage where the idea of publishing the Red Ribbon was formed. Writing the Red Ribbon was difficult, very difficult, I should say. It took me more than five years to complete with persistence, faith, sweat, tears, and an empty stomach in a humid room 60 kilometers away from Jakarta in a remote kampung where I only had the morning sounds of frogs and other insects around me and shared a bed with big black scorpions and spiders. It was completed but was hard to find an editor. I reached out to so many people for help until my friend Jin Jin Shu introduced me to my editor, Doc Ross Dunn, who is a father to me now. We would sit together and dialogue over editing and words for over 6 to 12 months. But there was no way to publish it once the editing was done. As a refugee, I literally don't have the right to sign a contract. It took a long, hectic time to find a representative. It was finally published in 2019 with more than 200 pages of length, but the wrong version of it. My father and I could only weep over that terrible situation. However, the Red Ribbons publication provided the opportunity to attend the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival. My hard work had paid off. I never thought I would be able to present my work in that prestigious event as a speaker, together with other authors, and recite poetry to an audience. But that had happened. Despite the relentless struggles and setbacks, I never gave up. The lesson I learned from all of these was, I had to keep on striving. It's striving even harder, though the goal seemed out of reach and frustrating. Yet, the challenges never end for a refugee. There are countless limitations and restrictions imposed on us. At some point, it feels like I live under a never-ending curfew. My only option, like those of many other refugees, is to focus on the far, far distant light yet to rise again. And I wish those of you watching me Open your hearts and minds and let us, refugees, taste the sweet fragrance of freedom. Freedom seems so beautiful, but we are not free. We only fantasize about it. We have the independent will to fly, but the word of chance pulls us down. Hold our hands 
and left us up because we want to celebrate our actual existence. And I hope the shimmering light of God shines through you with more compassion so those lost in unknown directions find their ways out and experience the real essence of an evil lasting home. Home that only knows how to mend and heal. Amen.